This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back my good friend, the gorgeous, the talented Lala Sloopman. And uh, we're going to have a pretty heart-to-heart conversation today about um, depression and anxiety because um, it's something that Lala knows something about. She's been going through it lately and she would like to talk about it on air. Um, We were going to do a second podcast back in October to talk about horror and stuff, but um, she had a lot going on at that time. But we're going to do this today, maybe even squeeze in some Christmas horror talk. Um, But we're going to talk about mental health um, as well. And it's going to be a great conversation because Lala, she is just so smart and articulate and funny. And it's going to... and. I think um, a lot of people out there listening is going to be moved by what she has to say because she she knows what depression and anxiety is. She's been through it, and this is something that a lot of you can relate to. So yeah, here is my new interview with Lala Slootman. Hey, Lala, welcome back. Hi, Tony, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm okay, what's going on? Nothing too much, uh, just, you know, anticipating Christmas and hoping my mom gets out of the hospital by the end of the week, so other than that... Why is, why is your mom there? She's been there since October 9th. She took her third fall in three years, and it looks like this will be the one that will keep her in a wheelchair. We don't know yet, but we shall see. I'm so sorry. That's that's horrible. It is. It is. Aww. Yes. I hope I hope she gets out of there soon and, and recovers. I'm it, just, that's just horrible. I'm so sorry. Three falls in, in how long? In three years. <sighs> how old is she? 68. 50, 58? 60. 68. 68. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's still... My goodness, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Is she in the same part of town as you, or, or...? We live we live in the same place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wish she was 58. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so scary, isn't it? This aging stuff is really scary. It is. Be, it never seemed scary when I was younger. <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be forty next year, and like I'm just thinking, God, fuck! I've just I've let so much time go by, and I don't even realize it. Yeah, I know, I know. Same. Yeah. Wasted so much time. Absolutely. So you you told me when we were scheduling, you know, one of the times that um, you wanted to address anxiety and depression, and you know, I've had my share of this in life, but let's start with your journey with it. How did it begin? Um, well, okay, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it began when I was tiny. Mm -hmm. Just, just being in, um, I mean, being a a child of the 70s and uh, super dysfunctional, Mm-hmm. Family members that didn't have the tools to self-regulate their emotions and have gone through so much trauma themselves that they just weren't equipped. Right. Uh, and I, I never really had a sense of um, self. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people pleasing everybody around me, so I never really felt safe being me or safe having an opinion. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of family uh, shaming that would happen, right. and so you know, by by, I mean, I can remember being very shut down and depressed at at eight. There was physical abuse. There was other abuse, mm-hmm. mental, emotional, all of it. You name it. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time I was a teenager, I would go months without being able to get out of bed, and I didn't understand that. Mm-hmm. 
but um, as I, you know, ventured off to live in, as an adult and and got married, and then drugs were a big part of that um, lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I found a way to self-medicate yeah. and deal with this stuff that I didn't even realize what it was, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's just been a long journey of that. Like, I would say, I, I would say underneath the uh, addiction and alcoholism, mm-hmm. my, my primary, primary core issue is... Um, being uh, an adult child of a dysfunctional family that sees life through the eyes of that wounded child that has a lot of criticism and limitations, limiting beliefs. Like, I, you know, if something goes wrong or something breaks or um, whatever, whatever mishap can go on in your day, mm-hmm. I view it as the end of the world, catastrophic, and I I'm, I'm, have like, this insane amount of, of toxic shame about it happening and why it happened to me and why it always happens to me. So this battle yeah. with myself is it's ever <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ever changing, shifting, sort of it morphs into all different kinds of things. It's like you know the layers of each onion, whatever peeling the onion. It just keeps getting. I keep finding another layer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's it's just genetic, you know, because it's been passed on down to you through, from family? Yeah, there's definitely... Uh, there's, I, my genes definitely play a part, but I... Honestly, my... my <sighs> the, the, to have... To have... I, I, to have an uncle that was so fond over mm-hmm. throughout my entire family mm-hmm. on both sides of my, mostly on my father's side of the family, mm-hmm. um, you know, the whole family just really thought that Gail, my uncle Frank's wife, was like their their lord and savior. She was their their she was their employer. She mm-hmm. was everything. You know, and because Frank had the the status that he had, um, everybody just did anything to keep her happy, even at the expense of myself or children or yeah. whatever. It, did, it didn't matter the expense, but I think that that really took. It, 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 I know trauma is trauma and neglect is neglect, but there was just this extra element that just was a little different and I know there's other families that have had to deal with this. There's other famous people on the planet. I'm not the only one that yeah. had a <laughs> you know well-known uncle in a in my childhood, but it did add an extra element of like it's more than just genetics. It's it's like this weird power trip of unbalanced uh, people just could, were blinded. Right. My, my dad, in particularly, very blinded by my Aunt Gail's power. And I fell under the radar a lot because of that. So I, <clears throat> a lot of it, I think, was his childhood, too. My grandmother was amazing, mm-hmm. but she was also super... I'm not a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> but I've been, <laughs> I've been in so many treatment centers... I, I can probably venture to guess there's some some narcissism on my this love side, maybe some bi- borderline personality disorder. Um, Same here. Definitely, yeah, some sociopathic stuff, perhaps. So that that's really hard to grow up with as a kid. And genetically, you know, there's a ton of addiction and mental illness too. My my uncle Squidget, my dad, my dad has two brothers better twins mm-hmm. midget and squidget and, and my uncle squidget suffers from schizophrenia and you know yeah. my grandmother would love to say that he caused it by taking too much acid when he was 17 but I've I've had my 23 and me thing done <laughs> 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 it's definitely a gene in my body 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my family, we're needy, codependent, hypersexual, nothing's ever good enough people. We're, uh, we're all prone to anxiety and depression. Um, there have been periods in my life that rank up there as my lowest points in life, starting when my Nana died 20 years ago. You know, I took care of her for nine months after I graduated high school. And once she was gone, I was depressed for four years. The third year became a little bit easier because I got a job and I was getting out and meeting people. But <clears throat> before that, I was just stuffing my face with Chipotle burritos and watching cult movies every freaking day. <laughs> you know, I, I, this podcast replicates the great memories of my childhood of watching movies, listening to music and watching television and also in my early adulthood as well, you know, and I really see the, that period as, you know, the, the formation of who I am today, really, you know, and I wouldn't be talking to this gorgeous lady that I'm talking to on the phone right now. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a lot. That's a lot to be right out of high school and and your your grandmother's caretaker. Yeah, so my mom was working, <sighs> and I was I was all she had during the day. My my brother was working during the day as well as the four of us living in the same apartment, and right. it was crazy. You know, another period is when. I lost my job at the first bar that I worked at. I, I poured my heart and soul into that place. I made that place what it became. And unfortunately, the owner will never credit me, mainly because I never told him what I did. And it's not like he would genuinely thank me. But after I lost my job, I rested on my laurels. I spent two years just doing nothing. And I started drinking during that period. And I don't regret the drinking per se, but I do regret the behavior that I exuded, and that was really horrible, and, you know, just shortly before I started drinking, I was exploited, some girl that had a grudge against me put my picture on this cyberbullying website, and I nearly drove me to suicide, but then I, oh my gosh. I thought to myself, fuck it, I'm gonna let, I'm not gonna let this destroy me, you know, she thankfully got banned from every place that we hung out at and stuff not long after that, and... But that was that wasn't good enough. I started I started drinking not long after that, you know, and it almost killed me when I had my car crash in 2015. Right. And, and that's what, <clears throat> that's when you got sober, right? In 2015. Yeah, I have not touched a drop since that night, and I'm just so blessed that I've been able to do that, you know. And I haven't even need AA or nothing like that. Oh wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah. It's I mean, really hard to do, but but I I, I commend you for doing that. <laughs> thank you. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, mm. eating too much and getting diabetes has been hard for me this year, but I've lost forty pounds so far, so I feel good about that. Um, how are you? How are you doing that? No sugar. Um, I, I, I still I still eat carbs, but only because there's there's sometimes there's just nothing else available. But I eat I eat an avocado every single day. Um, the first nice. first thing I do when I wake up, and yeah, I just been off the sugar. You know, I I eat these strawberry these strawberry ice cream bars that only have two grams of sugar in them. That's like all that I can have basically. <laughs> and. Mm. Are you walking? Do you take any, do you go outside doing exercise outside? I do that. I get on the treadmill. Um, that's, that's pretty much it, you know. I've dropped 40 pounds so far. And I go to, to the doctor January 11th to check my AC levels. The last time I did that was in August. Supposed to do it in October, but it got rescheduled. Right. Well, good. I hope it goes well. That's, that's a, that's, Incredible, forty pounds is is great. Yeah, um, my dad. My dad's diabetic, but he, uh, I'm, the one from eating too much sugar. What's that one? Two? Mm -hmm. Or one? Yeah. He didn't always have it. It just happened like later in life. Yeah, I knew I was going to have it. I just didn't think it was going to be this early. I was, I was, I was hoping at least I'd catch it at fifty or something. But right, <laughs> you know, it's just. I, I just became, I, I've always been a soda addict. My mother, too. She just, oh, my God, Pepsi after Pepsi when I was growing up. Um, 
And I, I knew that I knew it was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen early. But because of, of the depression of the the post accident trauma, I, I I just I knew it was going to be inevitable. I just didn't think it was going to happen so so fast like that. Right. <clears throat> That's the tricky thing about <clears throat> about um, depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, because um, some people have depression and they can still force themselves to make changes to make things better or they can or or, the, or they find the antidepressant uh that that makes everything sort of just click and go in and the p- picture gets completely focused and they now feel a purpose they take up surfing they're starting to do fucking yoga all the time mm-hmm. and then there's there's probably a few other types i'm the type where it's it, it does I I couldn't find the medication to make it any better. I I and then I got to the point where I've taken so many medications that I'm allergic to medications now, and I I I have the days the kind of days where I just can't do it. I just can't force myself to get out of bed. I just can't you know do Mel Robbins count backwards five four three two one and take the action. I just can't. Mm-hmm. My my chemical makeup. My, my whatever my childhood genetics whatever it is yeah. there's an inner critic which i like to call lucy she's like uh eight eight or nine years old and she i also have like an inner 15 year old that mm-hmm. they both of them just criticize every breath i take and keep me kind of trapped and some days getting out of bed and facing what would clearly make my life better, even just a walk yeah. up, up in Franklin Canyon, it would it would change something. But I I just can't take those steps. Steps someday. It's just it's really difficult. Uh, some people can identify with that kind of depression, and some people can't. And it's frustrating when people can't because it's like you, know, you, you don't understand. I can't just do it. I can't just get out of bed anyways I, and having having a, a child you know it makes it a little bit it gives me a little more incentive mm-hmm. but I still now that she's getting older and she can sort of fend for herself in the in, in at home um, you know like she can get out of bed and, and make herself something to eat and whatnot it's 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 starting to get a little hard again but I I am doing um, a couple different types of therapy and I'm trying everything else too. You know, I do meditation. I I try to get outside and go for a walk in nature. I try to um, listen to uplifting podcasts and my social media feed is filled with, you know, health healing modalities and whatever Mm -hmm. the fuck I can slap on. I'm trying them all, you know, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's not enough. It's a full time job. Yeah. My, my mom, you know, she's, she's had it pretty bad her whole life, uh, especially last few years since her boyfriend, she was with for a long time who turned toxic, you know, the last decade, you know, he passed away in 2020 and we we found out about it like ten days after it happened, and Ugh. it was it was really hard because I missed those first eight years that he was a great guy, and then after that he was just an awful guy. But it's also made me think at the same time: did what was he like that when the two of them were alone, and I just never saw it, or did something really snap in his brain and just turned him angry after he lost his job and he lost custody of his kids? Right, right. Isn't that interesting when you know somebody for a long time and then something, yeah. something def- definitely snaps or changes where they have behaviors that are mm-hmm. more dangerous than they used to be. It's, I've, I've witnessed that too. It's, it, I can't understand it. Sometimes I wonder if, if these people are having, if there's brain trauma or I don't know what. Yeah psychic trauma, spiritual, something, <laughs> something yeah. happens where these, these people have a definite switch. It's dark. It's deep, super dark and dangerous. And I'm sorry that that happened. And how come it took 10 days to find out it were, were they still together? 
No, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it had been two and a half years um, since they had even seen each other. After, after he pushed her down, that was it. She was like, "I'm, I'm done with you." You know, he was in a wheelchair at that point because his legs were all fucked up and he had cancer and all this shit. No, it took ten. It took ten days because. Um, his 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 daughter, who's in her early twenties, she in her early twenties, no late twenties by now. She's in her late twenties, and she's just very immature and stuff. She just you know called out of the blue and mentioned it, and um, the the quote unquote mistress that he was living with um, in the last six years, six or seven years, you know, she like basically took our 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 inheritance and ran with it and we don't know where she is. She's like nowhere to be found. It's a really fucked up situation. Wow. Yeah. Uh so you <clears throat> but it wasn't it wasn't that like nobody knew and they didn't find him for ten days. It wasn't it just took you just didn't get word of it for ten days. Actually, uh, actually, there were several days that people didn't find, that didn't know where he was. Uh, his lawyer actually called him for like five days before he actually went over to his apartment and saw that he was dead or something like that. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Wow, I'm sorry to hear all that. That's a lot. It is. It is. Uh, you know, and she's been, my mom's been just super depressed over this whole thing because she feels like she was blind for so long and it took her so long to realize, you know, what a piece of shit he became. And she just, she just can't forgive herself and I just want her to so badly and I hope she does and I hope when she comes home to us, you know, she, she will see things differently, but at this point it doesn't look like it. How long ago was this? Did, did he pass away? It was uh, Halloween of 2020. Oh, wow. Okay. Aww. I'm sorry. That that must That's really hard to watch. Thanks. Many yeah. Still blaming themselves for something like that. It is. It is pretty awful. Yeah. Now, d- depression and, and anxiety, I mean, I'm sure it's really been, it's been really tough for you in, in relationships, especially. Yeah, it has, it has, because <clears throat> I've had relationships, uh, romantic or uh, friendships, mm-hmm. where um, people just don't understand why I want to stay home all the time, or why I, I don't show up at the party, or the dinner, or the, whatever it is, like, I, there's, there's been times in my life where it's, it's a couple years even. Like, I, I remember 2007, 2008, I could go to work, and but on, on my day, and I'm doing that now, too. I'm trying to make changes. I, I, I am trying to go for a walk mm-hmm. on my days off, and I, I do go to equine therapy, and I, I do uh, CBT therapy. I, I was doing EMDR therapy for a while, but I, um, I still have these. When on my days off, it's it takes so much energy to do uh, costume um, to to work in production. That mm-hmm. the days off, I don't I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to go do something. I, I I don't feel like my free time is is spent. And that's the that's the other part of it too. Mm-hmm. Like I have a I have a criticism and I have a judgment about it. Like, I can't just say, oh, I worked all week, uh, 14-hour days, my nervous system is completely shot, so leave, leave myself alone and allow myself to take this day or two to lay around and watch TV. But instead, like, the, the, the inner critic comes in and is like, no, you should be in the park right now. You should be at the movie theater. You should have been at that Christmas party. Yeah. You know, all, this, all the stuff that, that, that you know, critic can do I, I'm like a, divorcing from that train of thought I, I'm a Gemini so I always constantly have an evil twin on my shoulder telling me <laughs> that I'm no good I should have done this I should have done that I've been really good though ever since my mom brought it to my attention shortly before her last fall I've been ignoring it and it's really worked well to my advantage and how do you do it 
I just freaking I look at things objectively, you know, I just think, you know what, I just did something really good and I'm just going to focus on that and not even focus on the, the bullshit, the what if is what I'm going to do, you know, I'm just going to erase the what if and not read too much into it and say, okay, I feel good right now because I did this and I'm just going to focus on it. I'm going to um, cash in on that feeling, so to speak, and just feel good and just uh, go on to the next thing so I can continue feeling good like this. Right. That's great. It's hard. It's hard work. It is. And, yeah. And so that's what I've been doing. And, yeah, being, being, being a Gemini is, is, is not easy because there's lots of self-criticism there. And... I just look back at all the times that I did that. I was like, God, why, why was I so afraid? Why did I, why, why did I, did I listen to my evil twin and just not do anything? You know, especially um, in the years, uh, you know, after I lost that job and I started drinking, I should have just done something else. If I could have any time period back, it would be like 2009 to like 2012. I wish I could have that period back so I could just fix everything and make everything right but it had to happen before, because it had to happen right <clears throat> right I, yeah I do that a lot too I wish there was a, uh, parts of my life I could redo or have a do over but I don't think uh, and I, I don't think I would have had the wherewithal to even I, I didn't go through the lesson to know what was important about what I should change at that time. You know what I mean? And I honestly believe that everything I've been through, all all of the the pain and loss and uh, every all of it has created the, the human being that I am today. Mm-hmm. And there's there's many times throughout the day that I'm super proud of that that person. And it's That's just good. it's just staying ahead of that inner critic and that that depression um, and it, 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 the, the trauma. It's like there, it's just staying ahead of all those those issues so that they can't gain. So they can't. They're not ahead and keeping me down. And, and it's it's. Sometimes it's really hard to do that, but it's getting it's getting a little bit better. It's getting a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, I mean, you know, because of the internet, we have become more aware um, of how quote unquote normal having having depression is because everyone's had it and everyone has gone through a lot you know there's a lot of people out there who lie and say they've never been through anything dark or anything everybody has you know and it, it, in one way it's good because you know you meet people and you find out you're not alone but also you also have this this also sense of, of cockiness of like you know you want to be the only one who's going through this so someone will rescue you you know Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the internet, man. Sometimes I feel like part of, it's part to blame too. Like I there's a I don't know statistically what it is, but mm-hmm. I know that kids the amount of kids that have attention deficit disorder or mm-hmm. OCD or anxiety is much greater with uh, the World Wide Web and social media than it was, say, when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, there's excellent things on the Internet, too. I find I can it depends on what, which, what you're looking for. But it's scary. It's scary to know that my daughter can come across something uh, in an algorithm that is not appropriate. It's it's super scary. Yeah. Um, I have like an app on my phone that gives me an alert if something possibly inappropriate comes across her phone, and then I, I I can check it out and see it. And it's sometimes it's it's nothing, and sometimes I'm like, holy fuck! <laughs> <laughs> you 
know what I mean? And, and, and I also have to say, mm-hmm. sometimes it's my iPad, and she's going through my photos, and I took a funny photo of a jokey thing that not a lot of people would find humorous. Yeah. I find it fucking humorous, and my daughter's mortified. <laughs> you know, I'm like, and then I have to explain. I'm so sorry. This is, a, you know, like a a, a a joke between me and a few of my dark, color sense of humor friends. Yeah, <laughs> and she's like, still like looking at me like I'm insane. How is that funny? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's a whole other generation, right? And I so appreciate them, and that they are so much more inclusive and. Um, you know, I, I really, I really look up to this, these kids that are with us coming into this world right now, that just had like, there, there's no, there's no racism. There's no, I mean, you can, yeah. it, I, I just love it. I love it. But it's hard to, it's hard to learn a new language for them. You know what yeah. I mean? It's hard to not be offensive accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I I I, just, I I don't mind that, you know, they they're more inclusive and everything, but they just they got to learn, you know, the sense of humor about the past and it's really hard because everyone's trying to erase history now. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It's awful. Yeah, sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I trust if I trust our history that we were we were taught yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I trust any of them. Well, there, there, they are very valid points about different things, you know, about the past, right? But you yeah. know, when, when you know, you grew up, you know, a certain way and stuff, it's it, it, it can be really hard, you know. But no, in my family, I mean, where we've always been inclusive, you know. I mean, yeah, our sense of humor is very body and very dark and. It's and it hasn't changed at all, you know. But we're ve- we're very respectful of people, and we we we've we've always been inclusive. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's yeah. I mean, it's for instance, if I if I'm working on a commercial, mm-hmm. doing wardrobe, and I, I we have talent that is uh, going by a, a them they pronoun. Yeah. yeah. It's it's it's. Really, it's really hard not to make that mistake, especially in a fitting. Um, can you hand me her belt, or can you? Ha- can I see the shoes that she was going to wear? Like, I, it's it's a mm-hmm. constant. I have to constantly watch how I'm talking about the items for this particular person because it, I'm not. It doesn't come natural to me after 52 years of saying, mm-hmm. "Can you can you hand me their belt?" or what was you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean I I and I get it. I I I one hundred percent get my my version of why I would want to have a they a them they them pronoun as mm-hmm. opposed to she her. Yeah. Is is because I feel I'm I feel like growing up as a child in this in the seventies and eighties, you know, men boys were taught to not cry, not feel their feelings, be tough. Be stronger. Not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and girls were told that they had to look pretty, and the only way they were going to make it is if they had, if they found, married a rich husband, or um, yeah. not to not to say no because that meant you were a bitch, and that meant you were difficult, and probably mentally insane. I mean, there's <laughs> just so many labels that are put on from my, what I remember of growing up in the '70s and '80s and '90s, and and. I personally would love to detach from both of those labels and just be a them they and stop. But it's it's not possible physically to look at me and and see me as that. It's gonna. I'm always gonna have that. Oh, she throws like a girl look when you <laughs> <laughs> see me from across the room. You know. Yeah. But I I get it. I. I, I love that. I would love to break away from some of those stereotypes. This is, uh, speaking of stereotypes, can I tell you a funny joke? Of course. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Um, what did the blonde say when her doctor told her she was pregnant? What? Is it mine? 
<laughs> I've heard that one. I, I just forgot the punchline. You've heard it? You've yeah. heard it already? Yeah, I, I, I know so yeah. many jokes. I have like a whole roll of decks. You know, I know, you're, you, I know you have a lot of jokes. I thought for sure you hadn't heard that one yet. I did, but I forgot it until you told me. <laughs> I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. I just, the, the thing I don't like about the pronouns is that I, I feel like, you know, that um, Trump really, like, pr- provokes some entitlement into the um, the gay and transgender community, and that I just feel like it's an entitlement issue and intolerance of other people. That's just my view on it, you know? So, uh, so I'm not, I don't know if I understand you feel like Trump yeah, like, pushed, pushed an entitlement, on, like gave them entitlement or allowed them? Yeah, like, um, how should I say? Like, you know, they say, uh, you know, because it's at the point now where everybody wants to shame everybody, right? So they're, so they're like, you know, you better refer to me as them, they, or, or whatever, or we're going to shame you. You know, it's, it's, it's almost got this, like, Black Panther approach to, like, you know, in, in enforce, enforcing, in, in enforcing, you know, people to, like, you know, get, get with their program. Right, right. Yeah. And it's yeah, like, I, no, I see what you mean. There, and there's also a ton of people that are really soft and, and yeah. sweet about it, too, that are just, like, yeah, I just don't like the, remind you. I just don't like not, the... I don't like the negative energy of it. That's what 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 it is with me. And and you feel that Trump is um, to blame for this? Well, because or? well, because he's you know racist and homophobic, you know, and he just he pissed a lot of people off, you know, when yeah. when he when he came into office, you know, and yeah. I just think that you know everyone started you know exercising entitlement because they figured oh. He, <laughs> He's doing it. He's doing it. So I'm going to do it too. Let this lunatic run the country. So fuck everything. Is that the vibe? (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, you know, they may not agree with him, but they see the energy that he's putting out there. And so they're, they're copying him, so to speak, without, you know, giving it some thought, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I have two, two friends that, um, went full QAnon when mm-hmm. he was in office, and I just, I, I, I mind blown on, on that whole trip. The, the, and, and I just can't even believe that anybody would ever vote for that person. I know, the night that he got elected, I sing your uncle's song, Bobby Brown in karaoke, and <laughs> it got huge laughs, huge uh, laughs. That was one of my favorite songs when I was little. Yeah. <laughs> When you were little. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, that's the worst thing to say, right? It is. It gives you a little peek into my childhood. Like, when I was seven or eight years old, uh, Sheik Your Booty came out, and uh-huh. I believe that's on Sheik Your Booty. Yes. And that was my, I mean, I was living in the house at the time, so in the, the, the basement was his studio, and he was nocturnal, so the, the, the music was, you know, vibrating through the house all night long into the morning Mm -hmm. and he was making that record so it's like I knew the lyrics to that song all that the whole record before it even came out and that was one of my that one and flakes I love flakes yeah I (laughs) I um I'm trying to think here yeah my dad he had you know all the all the records he had Captain Beef's Heart Beef Hearts records and all of that stuff. He he loved all that subversive underground music, you know. And yeah, he loved. Uh, I mean, he loved mainstream uh, shit as well. But like Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart, yeah, he he really he really loved the comedy element uh, of those albums. Right. Yeah. They were pretty great. And listen, I wish I I'd love to hear what he. I'd have to say about the last uh, several years on the, in this country, he probably wouldn't live here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> probably would have hightailed it out of here a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, it's crazy. But uh, I've seen you post um, about, uh, about Lulu's special education fund. So wh- what's that about? Lula, my okay, so my mm-hmm. daughter's... Um, She's got a 
actually there's something called a neuropsych test yeah. um, that they are going to run on her in January. It's like six sessions with the psychotherapist that will tell me um, after testing exactly what her learning disabilities are and how to best teach her. Um, from from what I've seen, she she needed an IEP, which is an individual education program. Oh yeah. Uh, she's needed one since about second grade, and and I've been asking for one since third grade. And the school we were at, her elementary school, kind of fought me on it, and she, she completely qualified for one, and they said she didn't. Mm-hmm. So we we were able to we would have been blessed by this attorney who, who used to be a parent at, at our school years before we were there. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has an IEP child, student with an IEP, uh, and, and she turned her law practice into just representing families against LAUSD mm-hmm. because their IEP program continues to fail children. These schools continue to fail children because they don't have the means and they don't really care to get the means to teach these kids the proper way they, that, that, so they can learn quicker. And then to, to add on top of it that we had COVID and online schooling from the middle of third grade to, to the beginning of fifth grade, it was like, you know, all those kids that were home on Zoom probably didn't learn as best they would in the classroom, but my daughter didn't get her IEP until January of, of last year. So we have this attorney who took our case pro bono. Mm. And um, LAUSD will pay for private school. There's a private school sh- I really want her to go to called Westmark. It's, it's for kids with dyslexia and ADHD. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's a bajillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, to me, it's a bajillion. It's like fifty-five thousand a year, and I qualify for um, financial aid, which is a you know mm-hmm. a good portion, like twenty-four thousand. But it still would be like thirty-five hundred a month for her to go there. And LAUSD will reimburse it, but I have to pay it up front yeah. in quarters per year. So I pay uh, like for four months up front and then they'll reimburse me and I don't know how long it would take to get reimbursed because I'm I haven't gotten to that point yet but I'm just trying to get her out of the LAUSD school system because it's unable to help her at this point because she needed an IEP in third second and third grade so she's smart as a whip she's extremely talented she learns visually but she has no interest in being at school because she's behind in a lot of subjects, like, you know, her classmates know the times tables by heart. They know division by heart. She hasn't gotten there yet. And as hard as we work to do it, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, she has, she sees numbers backwards. She, whatever it is, it's just, she needs more help than what they can provide. So I'm trying to, trying to get her a little help to get into a school that, that can retrain her brain because there are schools out there that can help kids relearn and learn quickly. Yeah, I was in special ed for 13 years, or not 13 years, 10 years in school, you know, because I have Asperger's and it takes me forever to learn shit, and I was way behind my class, way behind. And my mom, she fought for me. She, We had meetings. You know, they told her that I was stupid and just, oh, my God, she came down hard on them. And Yeah. And I got through it, you know. I still have, right. I still have a high school level of learning and everything, but that's about it, you know. And I went to, I went to um, junior college for a semester. And my grandmother had died just previously, and I just, I wasn't ready. I just didn't want to go to it, you know. And you know, I, I, pr- I practically got thrown out of the the film class I was taking because I would correct the teacher in front of students, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so I totally get it, you know. But you know, I hope you get her. You hope you get fully funded, you know, so she can, you know, have the best education possible. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I hope so, too. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm looking at other things. I'm thinking about doing a podcast myself, and I, I'm sure. looking at other avenues. I'm taking my real estate license. I'm trying to get my real estate license. I'm taking the course right now. Um, oh. Because if, if, if I can increase my my income, then, you know, things would be a lot easier. Yeah. I'd have more choice. That's, money to me is choice. Mm-hmm. Without it, you don't have as many choices. I would like to have more choices. I, I know what it's like to have a lot of choices, and now I know what it's like to barely have any. And I don't like the barely having any choice. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, I'm trying to, trying to do what I can to get there. And people have been so sweet to, um, to share it, and thank you for sharing it. Um, of course. And I've, yeah, we, we, I'll keep on posting about it too because um, it's important. I, I don't. The thing that bothers me the most about it, and you might be able to relate to this, is mm-hmm. like in second grade, she knew there was a difference. I, we both knew. The teachers knew. Her report card said there was a difference. But and there's a, a, like ten other kids in her class that have similar issues mm-hmm. that also have a, a difference. But but. She, she took it in as as calling herself stupid. Mm-hmm. Started saying, "I'm stupid, mom. I'm everybody's smarter than me." And she started making a comparison, and that yeah. is like the self esteem that she's lost because of not having, not knowing how to, what her her learning disabilities were, and not knowing how to teach her tools to deal with them ha- has taken a little toll, and it's. It's a bum out. It makes her not want to go to school at all anymore. Yeah, I was that guy. But she wants to be homeschooled, and I, I wish I could do that, but that's, you know, I work 14-hour days sometimes. Yeah, I know I was that guy too. I was like, everyone was smarter than me. You know, everyone called me retarded. Everyone just uh-huh. made fun of me. I got I got bullied pretty badly. I mean, I was thrown in mud. I had garbage cans, oh my full gosh. Of, garbage cans full of leaves thrown over me. My brother, oh god, he got thrown into a garbage can once and broke his arm. That's horrible. Yeah, horrible. We, we were bullied pretty badly growing up, and. You know, a couple a couple of bullies of mine actually became good friends of mine later in life. Um, Did they apologize for uh, for being uh, like that when you of were course, little? Of course, and then there's a flurry yeah. of them who never will apologize because that's just right. who they are. They're fucking alphas, you know. But yeah, oh, I I got into a lot of fights. I'll tell you, and I I kicked a lot of asses too. <laughs> they were shocked <laughs> that I was so strong and that I could kick their asses. Great. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. I I had I got bullied a lot too when I was growing up. I think that even though even though we have we're so much more aware of people and racism and gender and there's a lot of there's a lot of awareness that we didn't have ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely forty years ago. There's still some pretty gnarly bullying going on at school mm-hmm. and, and and also cyber bullying I mean it's fucking Roblox games these kids are so mean to each other yeah uh, and it, and it's and, you know I don't know if you remember but being like a in junior middle school is like the coolest thing to do would be to roast somebody like how can you have a good comeback that just burns them and yeah. it's like uh, it breaks my heart now that I'm an adult to a child but I remember that phase like the cool kids had a cool fast comeback and you know it's just the bullying on on the bullying at school is gnarly it's super gnarly yeah I'm I'm not easily offended but I am very sensitive and it's (laughs) it's gotta it's got it's gotta hit the it's gotta hit the right nerves you know yeah yeah it's 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 pretty crazy, you know, and it's and it's and it's and um, you know, when I started doing stand up comedy at twenty three, a lot a lot of my generation they just their their comebacks were just very 
mean, like it was almost borderline bullying, you know. Um, you know, I, yeah. I started the same time as Ali Wong um, in San Francisco, and she said something to me that still upsets me. Um, you know, I was on stage and I did some joke uh, about Asian girls. I can't even remember what it was. And then she went on after me and she said, wow, Tommy, I have never heard such uh, such an, uh, such, a, such an observation about a- Asian girls ever in my life. By the way, where'd you get those retarded shoes? And that made me cry. That did. Ah. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. And she's just a, she's an awful person, Ali Wong, you know, and it's, it's just as well that she is very private, you know, when she's not, you know, doing um, a Netflix special or something and that she's doing uh, other work, you know, she, she like never, almost never does podcast interviews, you know, and it's just as well because I think she's a horrible person. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. She, yeah. Um, and other... I mean, so- People, I mean, in comedy, it's, it's got to be hard. You guys can be pretty harsh on each other. Uh, other comedians told me that she was a, a she was a twat to them too. You know, so you know, right. what, whatever it goes with the territory. Right. You know, like you know, last time we talked, you know, you asked me if I liked uh, Slumber Party Massacre too, and. Um, and I told you about what the director did to me and stuff. She wanted me to take the interview down and everything. I. Just interviewed a director. Turns out um, they're um, they're uh, production partners together, right? And I like her a lot. I mean, she loves rock and roll, you know, and she loves um, uh, horror and stuff. And I told her, I told her later, like you know what you know, her partner did to me and stuff, right? And it just it was it was another uh, one of those cases of you know she doesn't try to justify you know her actions, you know. It's just she's got this this narrative of like, you know, you know, get, you know, get used to it. I had to, you know, kind of a thing. It's just like, God, that's just so toxic. Right. Yeah. Are they, are they going to take down the other one too? Do they want you to take the other oh, one? Oh, no, no, no. She's not, she doesn't have that, that kind of mentality. You know, she, uh, she, she loved working with me. You know, she, uh, has um, a subscription, you know, to my channel, and I have a subscription to hers, and she likes my stuff. She's in my Facebook group and everything. No, 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 she's not like her, but she just had that. She just, like, you know, didn't want to justify her partner's actions, you know, and it's just, you know, that's kind of toxic, you know, in a way. But, you know, she likes me, so that's fine, you know. There's a lot of toxicity out there, boy. There is, and, and and I, I it's it's honestly sometimes I it's I can see that it's people's own trauma or or whatever it is that something something devastating happened to them mm-hmm. that caused them to, to treat people a certain way, and it's hard to remember that sometimes that everybody is coming from a wounded, hurt place that just wants acceptance, and it's hard to think that. These people aren't just just wretched human beings that just want to be cruel to people like that. That would be easier yeah. to think that. But I think a lot, you know, I've I've done some pretty horrible things to people in my in my day, either sober or not. Mm-hmm. Um, that I really regret, and I've and I've changed. I've been able to change my beliefs. Change. I'm sure I'll do something horrible again in the next couple months or years but I keep I keep working on myself I keep trying to be better I keep trying to appreciate and love myself so that I can model that for other people and especially my child mm-hmm. absolutely yeah I mean do you, you probably worry about whether or not you know depression and anxiety will, will affect her someday I, I worry about it daily daily what I worry more about affecting her one day is is alcoholism. Yeah. But you know, it it's it doesn't it won't have, it doesn't have to. I keep her as close as I can. I'm I'm overly honest with her about certain things. For, you know, like knowing the lyrics to Bobby Brown when I was eight mm-hmm. and knowing what a golden shower was. Like my my family <laughs> could have easily told me, oh, it's just like a shower where you have gold water. But they told me what it was, and and I was like, oh, that's normal for me to know that shit. 
because it was like it was mm-hmm. fucking normal for me to know what that meant. But you know, now I, 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 I'm, I'm honest with my kid about a lot of stuff. Some things make her totally uncomfortable, and she'll say, it, "Mom, I don't want to hear that information. I'm not comfortable knowing that yet." Yeah. But I, I, I want to keep her. As, I want to keep her in the know as much as possible and keep her as close as possible as long as I can. Because I, and, and when she, you know, she was in therapy for over a year last year. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I worry about, she's got such a happy, happy spirit in spite. She's mm-hmm. constantly skipping and happy about things unless she has to go to school. Yeah. But um, I do worry about genetics. I do worry about her dad and I both having alcoholism, like what that could do to her. Mm-hmm. I worry about it daily. It's, it's probably a waste of time because mm-hmm. I tend to have a personality that gives me a reason. Like I, I have to find a worry yeah. as soon as my eyes open. My brain just goes, where's the worry today that can keep us paralyzed? <laughs> 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 but slowly but surely... My brain's not going to do that to me, any, you know, to the extent it's getting better. I'm finding tools all the time. Yeah. Wow. What, what, what are going to be your Christmas plans? We don't really have, I mean, we're, we're going to have presents, probably mm-hmm. open a present on Christmas Eve is what we usually do. Mm-hmm. And then Christmas Day, um, I think we, we're going over to a friend's house. We might see my cousin Moon. Um, uh, t- my, tell her to come on. Tell her to come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We usually just kind of stay home. Like since it's been Lula and I. Uh-huh. You know, used to we used to go up to my aunt Gail's house for Christmas. She would have yeah. a big thing going on or somewhere. But the last. The last like eight or nine years, it's just been movie and I at home. We we're probably I used to love to go to a movie theater on Christmas Day. Amit and I, that was like we would go see three movies in one day because oh, yeah. it was so empty at the theater. But I haven't been. The last movie I saw was um, the David Bowie movie, which was beautiful. I want to see that. Yeah, um, Mark Maron interviewed the guy who made it, and so I've been wanting to see it. Yeah, I know. I know him. I, I did a commercial. He directed. I did wardrobe for the commercial. Mm-hmm. Directed. I can't. I think of his name right now. Oh my God, it's escaped my mind. Yeah. He also <laughs> directed the um, Nirvana, the Kurt Cobain documentary. Oh. Okay. Brett. Brett Morgan. That's his name. He's. Brett he's Morgan. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've got oh. I've got Ioni coming on soon. Oh, fantastic! Yay! I was I was supposed to go to her Christmas party last weekend, and I um I was working. I couldn't get there in time. I bought I still had I bought her a case of beer in my because yeah. I don't even drink, but I brought a case of beer to bring to the party, and it's in my refrigerator. <laughs> I got to give it to somebody. Yeah, she, uh, we were supposed to do it on Wednesday, November 30th at 12 o'clock, but uh, the legendary Joe Alves, who created the Shark and Jaws, that was the only day he could do it. And I've, been, I've been trying to get him five years, and he's in his late 80s. So I was just like, you know, hey, I'm, yeah. we're going to yeah, have yeah. to reschedule, you know. And she's like, okay, let's do it after Christmas. And I said, okay. So I am uh. friggin' excited about that, you know. And you know, I, I listened to her podcast, and it just cracks me up that theme song together we're weirder we're weirder together <laughs> and it's so cute they're so cute i love them as a as a couple i mean i've known ioni since we were 13 14 yeah and i love i love her uh marriage to ben it's just such a good union i love their podcast yeah oh god i just i have i have this um friend she's She's a comedian, and she's she's a very prolific writer. Now she comes out with like one or two books a year. The last few years, her name's uh, her name's Joy Eileen, and she's a she's a waitress at the Comedy Store. And uh, she, her and her husband have a podcast called "When When Wife Gives You Lemons," and it's just like <laughs> Ioni and Ben. They just they talk so freely about anything. They use a lot more a lot more 
a lot more uh, foul language than Ioni and Ben do, but it's pretty similar, you know? Yes. And they, they, okay, honey. They Sorry, my kids. It's okay. <laughs> they have a new episode um, every Monday or Tuesday. Is this, you, wait, were you talking about the uh, when, when wife gives you lemons, or are you talking about weirder together? Which oh, one? oh uh, when wife gives you lemons, yeah, they're... They're, they're pretty similar to Ioni and Ben in that, you know, they just talk so freely about anything, but they use a lot more foul language. <laughs> oh, they do? I got to check it out. I'll check it out. I, yeah. Yeah, every Monday or Tuesday, depending on the day, and it's on YouTube, but they also have it on Spreaker as well. So they do a week. Do you, how, how often do you do um, podcasts? Do you do it weekly? Do you do it monthly? What's your every almost every day? You know, sometimes two or three times, especially uh, depending on the season. Like right now, like in the holidays, I'm doing so many a day, like every day. That uh, this Thursday is my Friday, and I'm I'm not doing any until like the middle of next the following week. You know, until New Year's, which is great. I'm gonna have like four or five days off because I need it. <laughs> wow, that's that's a that's a lot of. So you just, and do you, do you have a special setup? Do you have to have like a, a recording system that's special? What do you use? And how do you do it? For me personally, I mean, generally everybody uses the MP3 thing. You know, I just use my iPhone. I've been recording it on my iPhone um, you know, for, you know, five years now. In the beginning, I did it differently though. I would record it on my um, my dictation recorder that I used to record my comedy sets on, but then I learned pretty quickly, oh my God, those, those, those dictation recorders, they don't last long and they get really fucked up. So it wasn't until episode 24 or five is when I started doing it on the iPhone and I've been doing it ever since. And I'm so embarrassed by those first 24 episodes because I would present myself on camera and then I would play the audio of that and the sound got really muffled after a while, you know, but thankfully a lot of those people came back on, so it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's that, amazing. That was kind Sorry, of... Inf- I, took a, I took a bite of a donut right, right when you were telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, that was that was kind of influenced by um, when when Judd Apatow was on, was on Marin years ago. He played recordings of when he interviewed uh, Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld when he was 16. It was kind of influenced by that, the dictation recorder mm. thing. Yeah, but no, I mean... Did you see that Gary Shandling documentary that Judd Apatow did? Yeah, he interviewed him, too, at that age. Oh, my God, I loved it so much. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Shandling that much until that documentary, and then they showed some really rare footage of him just killing, and I was like, okay, he was pretty good after all. <laughs> oh, my God, he was amazing. I, I was surprised to see um, how, like how much uh, meditation and spirituality he was interested in. I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah. But I, I knew that his TV shows would, were a must-watch every week. <laughs> you know, in the 90s and 80s, those are two of my favorite shows. Yeah, he was a pretty deep guy. Uh, but I used to see the It's Gary Shandling show on Comedy Central. You know, that that one with, with Gilda Radner shortly before she died is probably the most yeah. memorable one. Yeah, that was that was pretty that was pretty funny but sad when you, when you look at it now. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, hopefully my mom will be out on Friday and she'll come home and maybe we'll have um, a turkey or ham dinner or something. This year, me and my brother, we just had turkey chili for Thanksgiving. That was it. Say that again. I got an alert on my phone. This year, you and your brother were what? (laughs) We had, we had turkey chili for Thanksgiving. He, my brother makes really good chili, and so Yum. we had uh, turkey chili for Thanksgiving. But I, I really want a whole turkey or a ham at least for Christmas. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. And um, a guest of mine may come visit me. She said it depends on how bad the snow is in Canada. She's going to drive all the way to California to see me. And wow. Yeah, she just told me that the other day. I was like, "Oh, come on!" She's like, "No, I'm I'm seriously considering it if the snow's not too bad." <laughs> yeah. That's so sweet. Well, I hope your mom is is home and safe, and and you guys are able to all have your turkey chili ham, whichever side <laughs> on. I don't think. Will you be opening presents in the morning? 
Uh, no, because we're on a really tight budget this year, but I did get myself a present. Um, I got myself the uh, complete series of the Partridge Family on DVD. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I yeah. bet that's going to be fun to watch. From you, How many seasons did they have? Four. There's only really four seasons of that show? Yeah. I feel like, I, I thought you were going to say like nine or something, or twelve. Mm. I, I had no idea it was only four. The Partridge family, like no way. <laughs> Wait, what? No way, Denny Bonaducci didn't get any bigger. <laughs> I thought, I feel like he got so big in those four seasons. Like, he was a little tiny... A little bit, yeah, but like he, we we didn't get to see him be a full fledged teenager, you know, to the point where you know his voice changed that much. Right, that's true. I I was actually in a treatment center where he <laughs> um, was. Uh, there's this treatment center I was in it called Promises, yeah, in Malibu uh, in 1999, mm -hmm. and they have a they have a cool oak, which is like. They're sober and living after treatment. After you do the 30 days of treatment, you, you can move into a sober living that they provide, but which is super expensive. And mm -hmm. so there's a house manager of somebody who already went through the program, and he was the house manager of mm -hmm. Cool Oak while I was at Promises Malibu, but um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I ever really met him, but everybody, everybody remembers him. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to reach out to him next year. It's the 50th anniversary of Charlotte's Web, so, like, I want to... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I want to get a guest from that, so we shall yeah. see, you know. And, uh, oh, what did, what did you think of those jokes I sent you? Um, there's an email, right? It's like 10 jokes? Yeah, something like that. I don't know the number, but I did say a lot. <laughs> Yeah, some of them, some of them I thought were funny, mm -hmm. and then some, some of them I was like, oh, I think I might be too much of a, a, a mother to a woman, to a, to a girl, to, to find this funny anymore. But had you sent them in 1999, I would yeah. have been busting up at all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something has changed in me. I can still see the humor, but I, I, I am a little more sensitive. I, to I totally get that. When you become a mother, everything changes. You know, certain things are not funny anymore. But there was one in there I wrote. Oh, what, did, you, did hmm. you say which one? Wait, let me see if I can find the email. Mm -hmm. Did you say that you wrote it? I, I, I can't did. remember. I can't remember. But <clears throat> there's people who have found it funny. You don't say that you wrote any of them. Okay. Uh, the one that says, you know, how do you finger a virgin very gently? I wrote that one. <laughs> okay. That's so freak. That was, that, that was autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, it, 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 so there's that, it, that's what comedy is, right? It, it's a truth. Exactly. Something funny about a real experience. There you go. Exactly. I got. Let's see. Let me think of some here. Oh, why did the why did the blonde have a bruised belly button? I think he wrote this to me, and I can't remember why. Did because some he he thought it. I don't know why? She has a blonde boyfriend. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. What does a what does a redneck do for Halloween? What does a redneck do for Halloween? Pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I hope I don't get any any um, hate mail for from anybody in the south. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> for laughing at that. <laughs> Lala, thank you so much for coming back on, and I'm glad that, you know, we got something mean, meaningful out there, you know, because it's just, it's a, it's an, it's an epidemic that's, um, that's, that's plaguing our society, so I'm glad that we got to talk yeah. about it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Tony, and I appreciate your, your, uh, your friendship online, and, um, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and your mom, a Happy Holidays and your mom. 
is home safe and sound soon. Yes, and I wait for your Christmas card. It was my pleasure sending you that one. Yes, thank you so much. You should be getting it, and you'll, you'll probably get it tomorrow. Okay, perfect. <laughs> all right, all right. You have Take a, care, Tommy. Yes, you have a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and be safe out there. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Lala Sloopman. Oh, God, I just love her. She's just so awesome, and she's a survivor like we all are, and I'm glad we got to talk about all of that stuff today because mental mental health is important, and when you come from you know, a family of screwed up genetics, you know, it can, it can be crippling, but at least you know you're not alone when you talk about it and you talk with someone who is like-minded and has gone through the exact same thing. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.